welcome to the Church of St. Maltos here in Kinsale. The present building was built in the 12th century by the Anglo-Normans who came over from Britain. But before that, there had been a much earlier church here from the, the Celtic church tradition uh, for some centuries before. There are no remains of that church. But when the Normans came here to Kinsale, it was one of the ports in Ireland that they wanted to take because of the important trade benefits of having ports here in Ireland. And so they built the town as a defensive position, a defensive place with walls all around it. And hence the church itself also has this military tower, the fortified tower, which is very high as you can see. And this it's here in the lee of the hill behind um, and an important position from the wind and also an important position as part of the defensive part of the town. And round the rest of the church, there would have been battlements as well, because the people who came as the Anglo-Normans were thinking very much of themselves as the people who'd captured this bit of territory. And they were a little bit anxious or afraid of all the others that they'd pushed out and who were outside the wall. So we're here now at the door that we used to go into the church, but it actually was originally the door for the tower. This would have been the door into the tower, which goes up with several levels within it where people actually lived and people could prepare, if necessary, to defend the position if someone tried to come from outside. Here we are at the original west door of the church, the door that was originally the way in which everybody came in to the main part of the building. And we can see that it's a very ornate arch um, part of the structure that was built in the 12th century. But of course, now when we look through, we see that there is a wall because someone in their wisdom towards the end of the 18th or early 19th century decided to put a gallery at the back of the church and they needed to put a wall. So we can't use this as the normal entry into the church at this point. As we look at this, we see some of the interesting detail about here. Here we have the markings on both sides, where at some point we believe people sharpened their swords when they were coming here for whatever purpose, and they would have sharpened their swords on those bits of stone um, on, on the door. So there we have a, an empty space, a, a slate that's there, but originally there was a figure of the person to whom this church is dedicated, St Maltos. A little figure of St Maltos used to be there. It's a figure that was built of sandstone and that stone being outside was disintegrating in the elements and so it was taken inside. And now I'm going to introduce you to Pam Norris who is one of the two church wardens. Historically, the church wardens um, each carried one of these sticks, which were called wands. So we don't have any swords any longer, but the wardens still have their sticks. So the sticks are, were, were used in case people were causing trouble, coming to the entrance to the church, were going to cause a bit of trouble, and Pam could take her stick and encourage them to leave. As we see, we have a little symbol on the top of each of the two wands. A bishop traditionally wore a hat like in that shape called a mitre. And so that was the symbol of a person representing the church, the rector, the, the rector's church warden, the vicar's church warden, the priest's church warden had carried this one. And this, of course, is a crown, and it represented the state. And then that was the one that was carried by the warden who was elected by the people. So you had the church warden carrying his wand and the uh, people's warden carrying the crown, representing the outside of the church, the, the rest of the state. So today, though, Neither Pam nor the other church warden, Kevin, who are here, they don't use these on a Sunday. But if you do come along, they won't attack you with sticks today. <laughs> Unless <Okay>. you're really bad. <laughs> we saw above the door a place where there is now some slate. And in that place was this uh, 
figure, the figure believed to be of St. Malto's. This is the figure that was originally from the outside above the west door. And it may be older than the church itself. Thank you. On the other side of the wall that we encountered before, where the original west door would have let people in. The first thing that we come to here is the font, and that symbolizes the beginning of their journey at the entry place to the church as they come into the wider family of the church, if we think of it in those terms. As we look at it now, we see that, of course, it's all filled with these wooden pews. But if we use our imaginations, trying to think back several hundred years ago, there would have been no pews at all. It would have been an open space and used for people to gather as part of the whole community. The area up towards the altar would have been the sanctuary, it would have been railed off, but the rest could have been used for community gatherings and community meetings. And on the walls, there wouldn't have been any of the things that we see here, but there would have been uh, murals, depictions of the biblical stories in, on the walls, because at the time, people couldn't read, but they could understand the stories from what they had been told. And those people who were elderly or infirm were the people who could use the few benches that were towards the walls. And that's where we get the expression that a person is going to the wall, meaning they're getting a bit beyond it. They're getting beyond standing within the community. And so there would have been a few benches on either side for people to stand, uh, to sit and rest during services or during other meetings. This was the only public building at, for many years that w lots of people could gather in, and it would have been used for all sorts of different community activities. So we see on this side three of these that are called hatchments and two on the other side, and they would have been things that people used, uh, wealthy people used uh, at the time of their funeral uh, to mark where, their, the, the, where the, the funeral procession and then where their, the coffin was actually laid. And then here we have the royal coat of arms of King William uh, III, because after 1690 the town was taken by the Duke of Marlborough, uh, captured from, from King James II, and the, the coat of, royal coat of arms came to be in the town and were a sign of the person who was ruling the town on behalf of the monarch. And so we can end up then getting other memorials within the building as Kinsale becomes a very prosperous place for merchants and a very important military base. So some of the other memorials that we have in different places are to people who in their day thought they were very important in business terms or in military terms. This was a very important military garrison town and an important naval port with a Royal Naval Dockyard and so on. So in the present side chapel that we have, we have um, memorials to the Southall family. Then we have memorials to the Dorman family and a couple of them who were killed in the First World War. But the stained glass work that's in here is mainly the work of Catherine O'Brien, who lived from 1881 to 1963. And she was a very important person as part of the Irish group called Antur Glynn the Tower of Glass. That, that Tower of Glass movement was a very important stained glass artistic movement using very vivid, very bright colours. We're going to move on to look at one of the other windows. We have a very interesting window here, one of a number that remember people who were killed in the First World War. And this is to a Stephen Henry Lewis, an officer in the Connaught Rangers, one of the Irish regiments that fought in the Great War. And we have here an interesting picture in his memory by his family. He actually was killed in August 1950 in Gallipoli in Turkey. And it was part of an attempt to land Allied forces and get through to Germany 
coming in the back way, away from the Western Front, and it failed. And thousands of people from Ireland were killed and injured as part of that attack. And many people from Australia and New Zealand. It was the first time that soldiers from Australia and New Zealand had ever fought together. And Australian people and New Zealand people on Anzac Day, they still today will, always, they will have a gathering at dawn to remember what happened at Gallipoli. And the family of Stephen, in their imagination, they describe him in, in this window as a medieval knight in shining armour with a helmet and a sword. And the words, I have fought the good fight from the New Testament, they feel he's done his duty and he's receiving his heavenly reward from four different angels. But in fact, look at his face. Although their imagination tried to think of him as a medieval knight, they wanted his real face at the, the young age of 23 when he died. They wanted to capture exactly what he looked like too. So there is a very interesting depiction of a window remembering somebody from this community who died with the other 50,000 or so Irish people in the First World War. Here we see the remains of the Galway Chapel and Geoffrey Galway, who was a very wealthy person in Kinsale in the 14th century, he paid money to have the chapel built in order that uh, the priests of the time would continue to say prayers for him and his family after they had died. And that was typical of what some people with a lot of money at the time could have done. When it came to the uh, later 15th, early 16th century and the Reformation, because the chapel had been dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, that was something they didn't want to encourage. So it was closed and the remains are here. You can see the roof has fallen in. Um, some of the things were brought inside the church and are now, have been put more recently on the wall. Kinsale's Lusitania Graves Margaret Mackenzie was from a small fishing village in the Scottish Highlands called Sheldegg. She then immigrated to the United States where she met James Scheinman and married him in April 1915. They were due back to travel from Scotland on their honeymoon in May of 1915. However, they were requisitioned by the British Admiralty and were booked instead on the Lusitania. Tragedy struck the happy couple when the torpedo hit the ship. Although Margaret's body was recovered and brought ashore in Kinsale, she was not identified and buried with just unknown victim of the Lusitania outrage written on her grave. Several weeks later, however, the body of Margaret's husband James was washed up in County Clare where the authorities were able to identify him through a pocket watch from Wyoming. Margaret Mackenzie has a plaque bearing her name in St. Maltas graveyard. <laughs> 